business owners and their businesses. We want to transform the industry, eliminate the BS, build awareness, change perception, expand the market, and help the best property management entrepreneurs win. I'm your host, property management growth expert, Jason Hull, the founder and CEO of DoorGrow, along with Sarah Hull, my wife, co-owner of DoorGrow, and the COO of DoorGrow. Now let's get into the show. So our guest today, we've got Pete Newbig back on the show with VPM Solutions. Welcome, Pete. Welcome, Jason, Sarah. Thanks for having me. Yeah, good to have you. So now, Pete, you were an operator of a property management company, right? That's, and that's correct. Yep. With, with Steve Rosenberg. And you uh, really helped to dial in the operations there and build that up. And now you're helping people do this in their property management business with your uh, VA company. So we're going to be chatting about today the number one way to increase productivity and profitability. That's so correct. this should be interesting. And in the background, we've got our dogs eating stuff they probably shouldn't be eating. So <laughs> down the culprit. I don't know what it is. Okay. That's it. It's just random <laughs> stuff. All right. It's like a toddler. All right. Just putting everything in their mouth. All right. So Pete, what uh, what is the number one way to increase productivity and profitability? Let's get into the subject. Sure. So before I jump right in, uh, I'll, let me talk a, just I'll talk a, just a little brief history of of Empire Industries, which was the yeah, management company that we owned. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, we we came from the investor side, Steve and I. We partnered up. We owned about thirty one homes. Bought too many. Didn't know how to manage it. We loved the idea of buying the deal. We hated the idea of managing it. So we went out looking for management firms and then realized we felt we could build a better mousetrap, which we ended up doing. Our original vision, I know you talk a lot about vision uh, in, your, uh, in your coaching. Our original vision, we, we were going we to own 500 homes and manage them ourselves. And within a year, that vision went to crap and we ended up managing 60 homes and I owned 37 of them. I'm like, Steve, how are we managing these other homes? And we were third party managing all of a sudden because he felt that everybody needed help. And so we started third party managing. So that's how we got into it. And we ended up um, b building a better mousetrap and we created a third party management firm. And uh, we took it from those 31 doors that we had, um, all class D minus stuff, which is a whole other podcast. And I think you've actually listened to one of yours recently about, about something like that. Uh, so we ended up taking it to about 980 single family homes and nothing more than four units in Texas, single families, one to four units. And we went to three markets. We were in Houston, Dallas, and Fort Worth. And uh, what happened was with us, our vision is, was no longer aligned. Steve wanted to take the, uh, the, the property manager firm national. I wanted to literally just stay in Houston and get like 1500 homes. And, uh, and so that fractured our, I wouldn't say fractured our relationship, it fractured the partnership to the point where we decided to sell the business. Long story short, I couldn't afford to buy him out. And uh, he didn't want to buy me out. And so we ended up selling to Mind Management, took a job with them for a couple of years and uh, realized I was no longer employable. And that's when I started VPM Solutions. So, yeah. so that's how that's kind of the, the short the short version of it. But we were in chaos mode for for many, many years at Empire. When you're in high growth, I, I don't know if you've seen this with your clients, but we were in high growth. And when you're in high growth, you seem to be in chaos mode. And when you're in chaos mode, you don't make any money. Uh, yeah. We didn't anyway. And, uh, and, and so what we had found was our number one challenge was payroll costs. So the number one challenge that I've seen, and I've talked to a lot of people across the, across the country, your number one challenge is either growth or payroll cost. And yeah. this interesting thing about property management, because it's a service-based industry and because it is so, uh, it's so service-based that you almost have to stress your team out to make money. Right. So you're on this this kind of seesaw where I don't really have that many doors, but I need the people. But the, so the salary cost is so high that there's no money for me as I grow yeah. the doors. Right. And now I, I don't hire anybody, but now I'm making money. But my team is now completely stressed out. They work in weekends. They work in nights. So I had to figure out how to get my payroll costs down from 56 percent all the way down to about 30 percent. And I'll tell you how I, I did it with virtual assistants. So I'll, I'll let the cat out of the bag. Right. And, and but, but we got it down to about 34%. So from 56 to 34%. And every percentage that you save in payroll costs is a dollar in your pocket. 
But then you'd be like, well, Pete, if you have less people or, or you, you know, you, you have less payroll, typically you have less people. And if you have less people, your team is stressed. And I get all that. But yeah. let's talk a little bit about what happens when you have a stressed team. OK, so when you have a stressed team, the little things go out the window. Right. All of a sudden, you're not making those calls to get those to get those uh, online reviews. All of a sudden, you're not making the calls and your communication goes goes downhill. And when a property owner, uh, oh, I'm sorry, when a when a landlord owner or an owner client calls you to find out what's going on with the problem, whether it's maintenance, lease, renewal, lease, whatever it is, they feel like they're managing you. So when you're not proactive in your business and you're reactive, you're losing trust and churn goes out, goes goes up. I'll give you at Empire, our churn was around 34%, which is insane, right? The average churn in the business, my understanding is like 18 to 20%, right? And this that's is annual churn. Yeah. Yeah. So it's high, right? 34%. And I can tell you that the majority of it was people were unhappy with our service. Yeah. Right. So it wasn't good churn, right? Because you have good, neutral, bad, however you want to define it. We had mainly bad churn. People weren't buying or house, selling houses and like, all right, we're out of here. We sold. No, they were taking them because they were not getting the, the, the love, the communication really from, from us. So by, by having these payroll costs so high, mm. I couldn't afford it. I couldn't afford it people. So what happened, especially after 2020. So what happened in 2020 with that pandemic mm. is that the, the cost of hiring people shot, got, got incredibly high. Right. So I call them low level, low enjoyment jobs. Let's take a maintenance coordinator, for example. Right. That's the number one uh, job that is posted on BPM solutions today is a maintenance coordinator. So that's the first thing people look for typically. Well, a maintenance coordinator in Houston, Texas, back in 2018, 2019 was about a thirty five thousand dollar a year job. Right. Well, after 2020, the people that wanted to do that job, they wanted like about fifty, fifty five thousand dollars. Right. Yeah. In the, the company just can't absorb that. They can't afford to hire people. On top of that, the type of people that we were getting were GEDs or high school, you know, diplomas, no longer college educated people wanted that job. And that brings on a whole other, most of those people have challenges in their life and they bring them into your business. Mm, yeah. So um, it just all came to a head. I had a, I'll tell you a quick story. I had a, I had a lady named Sharon. And Sharon was my front office coordinator. This is back in the day when, when we had these things called offices and office space. Yeah. You know? So I remember people, those days. Remember those days? Yeah. Like in 2019 and beyond <laughs> and before. Yeah. So, so people would walk into our office, drop off rent or whatever. Right. And Sharon was this, she was like this angry lady. And I'm like, this, this tells you what my hiring pro, you know, process was back then. It was not very good. Right. And some of the things that you, teach. I'm like, man, I wish I would have known that back in 18, 17 and, and 19. So she's the wrong person. Uh, she was the wrong person and she was the wrong fit. But in my, in, in my mind, I'm like, well, she's a, she's mean. I'm like, she'd be great for a maintenance coordinator, right? She can tell people no all the time. So I decided instead of firing her, I decided to promote her, right? Which was a terrible mistake. So I yeah. promote Sharon to maintenance coordinator. Now, unfortunately for Sharon, she was my maintenance coordinator. I was actually managing properties back then at the time. And, uh, and so just for that, you probably should have got some hazard pay. So I get that. I'm not the easiest guy to work for, especially when I'm managing properties. Right. Yeah. So Sharon comes and within one week now I gave Sharon a raise. So I moved her from front office to maintenance coordinator. She was making about 35. I gave her like 40, $40,000. She's making what I think is decent money. You know, it's not great money. I get that, but it was good money. You know, at the time within one week, she comes to my office and she tells me she needs more money. I'm already just scraping by as the business, you know, just, just trying to just, just scraping by single digit profit margin. So that's when I realized that I could, I could eliminate her position. I can hire three people that are overseas for the same cost as one Sharon. But the, here's the big difference. Those three people, they're obviously bilingual, right? And here in, in, I'm in Houston and Dallas and Fort Worth at the time, Spanish is kind of like half, half our, a lot of our tenants, about a third of them didn't really speak English. A lot of our vendors, Spanish was their first language. So I can get bilingual people. I can get college educated people. I can get mm -hmm. people that are ready or, or knowing that they want to work from home. Um, and here's the most important thing though. I can get people that were not just a J-O-B to them, but a career. And they were excited about the opportunity <laughs> to work uh, with us and for us. And so yeah. the attitude and all of a sudden I can find people that align with our core values. Yeah.
I mean, that's significant to be able to find people that align with your core values. Yep, 100%. But now I have three people doing the work. So now what happened is I had a little uh, hesitation from my property managers, right? Because property managers are designed to be taskers, right? So I had to like take my property managers and I had to lift them up. And we actually changed the name. We said, you're no longer considered a property manager. You're a client relations specialist, mm -hmm. right? Or an asset manager. I like asset manager better, but that was one of the, the fights I lost with, with Rosenberg. If anybody knows Steve, he's 6'4", full of muscles. So we arm wrestled and I lost on that one, you know? <laughs> we call them client relations specialists. But you wanted to call them what? Asset, asset managers. managers. Asset managers. Okay. I think an asset manager just has a little bit more cachet. And if you really think about it, right, how many, how many clients do you have, if you're listening, that call you up and tell you how to manage their property, even mm -hmm. though you're the expert? I felt the property manager, I call them gophers. I felt the property manager, they had to take these calls from these owners all the time and say, hey, go to my property, make sure the water in the pool is being filled up. Go to my property, gas man's going to come there. Uh, I want to know about this $12 expense. Meaningless and, and small conversations. You would never have those conversations with the guy managing your money, right? Imagine calling your Smith Barney guy and say, I don't like the way you made this trade. Like you should make this trade different. Like, no, you just let the guy do his thing. Like, so how do you let uh, us do our thing? Well, words are powerful. And property manager to me has lost its, its luster. And it just reminds me of, of a gopher. So asset yeah, manager. I, I think also the phrase property manager in the property management space has become kind of like saying miscellaneous role. Mm -hmm. it, that, yeah. Like it doesn't have meaning a lot of times. Sarah it's runs into everything. this a lot with coaching our clients. Like what does your property manager do? And they're like, they pretty much do everything. Everything. Like, oh, okay. That's. Yeah. And that's a problem. And the reason why they do everything is because they can't afford more people because the mm -hmm. margin is so slim, right? So we, we got to the point where our property managers got elevated. We made them client relations specialists. And what does that mean? It means that they had to learn a new skill. They had to manage by reports. They had to manage people because now all of the low level property management tasks were being done by my team in, in, in the virtual assistant world. Right. And when I mean everything, but by the time Empire was done, now granted, we we're you know almost a thousand units, but at that point we can hire some people. Everybody had one hat, which was a beautiful thing. Because now you can have your job description really set, you can have your KPIs really set, you can have your disk profile really set, and you can you know how who to hire, and they have one or two numbers, and they end up doing a much better job than the manager who's doing all of it. So I had somebody who just did lease renewal, somebody who just did collections, somebody who, you know, I have four people doing maintenance, somebody just did turnover and we became more departmental, right? So over the, over the course of, of your growth, you have to change your, your infrastructure, right? You go from portfolio to hybrid, hybrid to, you know, departmental, departmental to pod and, and, and all that good stuff. Um, I got to departmental, we never got to pod and then we sold. That, would, that was probably going to be the next move for us. If you don't have your org structure correct, doesn't matter how many whistles and bells you have. I can have property meld and I can have Zapier and I can have lead simp. I can have all these things. I can have a bunch of VAs. But if your org structure is not correct, it all goes to he hell in the handbasket. Just even, even quicker, right? Because now you have all this stuff happening even faster and it just yeah. gets crazier. And so with us, what we did is um, we had the structure. We, right? So now the managers are now, they're not taking those first phone calls. Because what was happening, Jason, is that when people would call, right, an owner client would call, my manager would pick up the phone. And as they're talking to this person, they're literally online and, and doing 14 tasks, responding to 18 emails. And people can hear that. They can see that and they can feel that over the phone. Mm -hmm. And so what do, what do they do? Like, well, you don't really have enough time for me. I'm going to go take my property elsewhere. Or if you mess up, you know what? Not only do you not have time for me, you mess up, Right. So now what we do is we have everything happening on a low level. My managers told me, and I've talked to other managers since, my managers told me that maintenance took 80% of their time, mm -hmm. right? And so I've heard that time and time again. So that was the first thing. So everybody always asks like, okay, if I do hire mm -hmm. a virtual assistant, what's, what's the first thing I should hire? And the answer is it depends. For me, I knew my churn rate was directly related to the way we handle maintenance. I knew it. Like I didn't have to have a consultant come in and tell me that, right? I just getting beat up every day by it. So I ended up hiring, uh, I was going to hire one re remote team member. I ended up hiring four, right? Mm. 
and I trained them figuring that somebody's going to drop off, but I wanted to train them all together. Now I did the training. Training is like literally the most tedious thing ever. And nobody wants to train. Everybody wants to hire somebody that they know exactly how to do it. And they know exactly how to do it your way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It doesn't work that way. Right. I right. Mean, you have to take two steps back to, or one step back, take two steps forward. What people mm-hmm. don't realize is the time you spend training your people, you get back in perpetuity. Sure. Yeah, forever. Because if you if you train your people correctly and you have good core values and you have a great culture, they ain't gonna leave, right? People are so worried. I'm gonna train this person, they're gonna leave. Yeah. Are you running a crappy company? Right. If you're mm-hmm. running a crappy company, then yeah, I'd be I'd be freak, freaking worried too. Right. Yeah. So make sure you're running a great company. You train the people, and then here's the great thing: as people moved on, whether they moved on and got, and got another another job or they moved on because I promoted them, guess who did the training for the next batch? My team did the training for the next batch. Yeah. By the way, my churn rate for my my remote team was way less than my churn rate in my U.S. team. Mm-hmm. Like incredibly different. Yeah. Churn rate of retaining of clients members. of oh, team members. Team members. Yeah. Retaining team yeah, members. You have churn rate of clients and you have churn rate of team members, right? My churn rate in the yeah, US- their loyalty is just a lot stronger because they don't get these kind of opportunities as often. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So once once my maintenance team was was on board. Now my manager, I literally saved with the, in their minds 80%. But here's the funny thing, right? So as I'm training, right, um, my I had a director of operations. Her name was Margo. And I still talk to Margo today. I love Margo. She would come to my office every day for 90 days. She came to my office with her cup of coffee every morning and said, I don't think these VAs are gonna work. I don't think these virtual assistants are gonna work. Okay. Because when I was training, right now I did the training, not Margo. Right? I was training them, but when I was training them. What we had to do was every work order had to go to the property manager, then to the virtual assistant. Then the virtual assistant would talk to the resident, the owner, bring it back to the property manager because they were getting, they were training, right? So they had to learn what, what to do in each situation, which caused my property managers more time, right? Mm-hmm. So that 80% went to 90% or even 100% or 110. Yeah. Now they're working extra hours. So they hated it. On day 91, and I, 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 I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but I, I, I shit you not. Day 91, she comes into my office and she has her same cup of coffee and I'm getting ready to listen to the spiel. And she goes, do we have maintenance anymore? And I laughed and it it took 90 days, but I got it. The point where so all of the work orders were being done by the remote team that nothing was getting escalated anymore. Only very little things, right? So my managers, you say, what do they do? Well, they take on all the escalations. Now imagine what what brain power, right? Your team, you know, my, my team in in uh, United States, they were the ones that were the experts, right? So, but imagine if they only are dealing with, with, with high level escalations, not all the other little, because how many times did I have all these little things get done, but then we miss the big thing. And then all of a sudden what happens is I call them taps, two by fours and Mack trucks, right? A tap is basically a maintenance request that's going unanswered for let's call it 15 days. Okay. That's, that's, yeah. that's a tap. The two by four is now the resident bypass you calls the owner. Now the owner knows that it hadn't happened or the resident blasts you on social. And then the Mack truck is the lawsuit that gets across your desk. The tech, the report, the, the um, complaint to the, uh, the, the real estate commission, right. Mm-hmm. Or you just get, you, you know, or you lose a client, right. Yeah. Those are two. By, those, so my team was so busy that they were missing the taps that they were becoming two by fours. And these are called fires. All right. And all we're doing is, is trying to, is trying to, Deal with this fire. And then, of course, every once in a while, you get a Mack truck, right? And it's like, what the heck? So now that my managers are not doing the day-to-day stuff, they're able to be proactive. So they're looking at reports. They're literally looking for taps. And now they're solving those taps. What that means is now the owner client's not calling you to find out what's going on. You're calling them. You're reaching out to them. You're letting them know. Or you're taking care of it before before it even becomes an issue. And so by by having your high-dollar... Uh, you know, people that are licensed and they, they have experience by allowing them to not do the low level, low enjoyment stuff. They actually became um, not, not only did they take all the escalations, but they actually became internal salespeople all of a sudden. And this is stuff that we didn't anticipate all of a sudden though, like my, my company's name was empire property management and realty. Do you know that 90% of my customers had no idea that we could buy and sell homes from them? Mm. We're called realty. I had yeah. no idea. But once I got my property managers to be client relations specialists, guess what's happening? All of a sudden, people are want to buy houses and they're buying them through us. 
all of a sudden people want to sell, they want to sell through us. So all of a sudden our revenue goes up, right? Yeah. Then all of a sudden they're like, who do, who do investors hang out with? They hang out with other investors, right? You're the, you're like the five most, what is, what's the old saying that uh, you hear you're the average of the five people you hang out the most. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden they're get we're getting referrals. We never got referrals before. <clears throat> So now we're getting a bunch of sales. We're getting a bunch of referrals. We're getting people to buy stuff where, where we're the, uh, we're the agent, right? And when you're the agent, you get, you build that, that um, relationship. And so now all of a sudden our churn rate dips down to, I think it was 22% from 34%, right? So the interesting thing is I told you when I first started, right? I went from 54% to 34% in payroll costs. My payroll actually stayed the same. It was the churn rate that went down, increased my revenue. It was the yeah. other clients, right? And retaining people and getting more clients. That's what, that's where the difference was. And now my managers were incredibly happy. They're no longer working nights and weekends. They're no longer stressed. Right. Uh, and so now they, they are, they're, they're having a, the best life ever. And uh, my, my VA team, my remote team, they're making more money than they've ever made before and um it was easy to and then I, and then they all had kpis and they were all like people want to inherently do a good job they do mm -hmm. right um and so but they don't know how to do a good job unless you tell them what that looks like and, and that's the job description and then they want to they want a report card and that's kpis and my team uh down there we had them in mexico because they're spanish speaking but what happened was um again another thing that we didn't realize was not only the team do the work they hit the KPIs, they exceeded the KPIs, and we created a bonus structure around the KPIs. So if you, if you, if you hit the KPI, you got a firm handshake, an attaboy, a thank you, right? But if you exceeded the KPI, you got a bonus. And if you were part of a team, everybody in the team added the KPI or you didn't get the bonus. And mm -hmm. what I like about with the virtual team is the bonus was $100 a month. Right? If you hit a certain level, you got $100. $100 yeah. for us wasn't a lot of money. A hundred dollars to somebody in the U.S. like literally would get mad at me. Like that's a little, that's too little of a bonus. It doesn't even fill up my car, right? And they throw it at you. A yeah. hundred dollars to somebody in the Philippines or Mexico or Costa Rica, it's it's an extra couple of days of work per month. Mm -hmm. So they were really appreciative of, of that, you know, of the opportunity to make to make more money. What happened was everybody started exceeding their KPIs to the point where I couldn't even hit the, I couldn't make the KPI any more difficult. Like it just wow. is what it is, and they were just doing it. And then here's the magic. What happened next was they ended up updating or changing the process. So my, my, my deal as the business owner was I am the policy maker. I make the policy, but you own the process. And when somebody comes in and says, hey, I changed the process. And I use this uh, example a lot. I had Jessica who was running all my lease renewals. So we had a, a, about a thousand units and I had one person doing all lease renewals, inspections and lease renewals. Our policy was that you could not do a lease renewal unless an inspection was done, an annual inspection was complete. And we used to start the process 60 days out. Jessica moved it to 90 days out. And when I was talking to her, I'm like, Jessica, I'm just curious, what made you? And I don't, I try not to ask why questions because why questions mm -hmm. put people blame, excuse, deny below the line and they get defensive. Mm -hmm. I asked, what made you decide to move it from 60 to 90 days? And she goes, well, with 90 days, I can do X and Y. Like I can get to the owners faster. I know if the, you know, if the residents do it. And she, she laid it all out. And I'm like, amazing. She was doing a better job than I could have done because that's what her core focus was. Yeah. She mm -hmm. was just on, on that. And he'll, she, so then what, what people will say to me is, Pete, okay, well, how do you know she's, not just, she's just not doing the lease renewals and not the inspections because she wants to hit her number? Mm. Right. That's the first question I get all the time. And I say, well, we we hire people based on our core values. And one of our core values was integrity. And so if you hire people with integrity, they're not going to do the loop around. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just and then, of course, the old, um, you know, trust, but um, trust, but verify. Mm -hmm. Sure. I was able to run reports very quickly that determined all the lease renewals and if they had an inspection done. Like, so mm -hmm. I built the reporting. <clears throat> It was very, very simple to to make sure that I was I hold them accountable. And yeah, that, that's another core value of that we had is we hold people accountable. We run our business by numbers. We hold people accountable, and so that's uh so so because we did all of that, we were able to solve our challenge of no profit or single digit profit margin to you know double digit and eventually get to about that 20 percent profit margin even though we even while we were still investing in a lot of money growing the business mm. 
Yeah. So we've, I I love all the stuff you've been talking about. I think we've had some phenomenal results getting clients to improve their profit margin. And we've got clients easily getting up to 40%. Sarah ran her business over 60. And, you know, I think the three biggest profit levers are building a really solid process system, a really solid people system, and a really solid planning system. And that planning system we call door grow os but that was really where we started to motivate the team to think in terms of outcomes and get them to think more strategically like business owners and so that strategic work is what moves businesses forward that's where they're innovating that's where they're improving a process that's you know and so those kind of goals if we give a team member an outcome and we say figure out however you can best do this you know, within our values, with integrity, figure out a better way, then I'm not concerned about micromanaging them. I, I, we're less involved in managing the team. They're now managing themselves because they're trying to achieve the outcome. And a lot of team members in a lot of business don't even have job descriptions. So they don't even know what outcomes they're expecting. If you're not sure what they're supposed to do, how do they know what they're supposed to do? Right. Mm-hmm. And if you ask anyone listening to this, if you ask your team members, this would be a curious and interesting experience for you or experiment. Ask your team members, what are the outcomes that you think are most important for your role? And compare that with what you think they are. I think you might be surprised. These should be agreed upon and defined, right? That should be in the job descriptions. Yeah. Agreed. Mm-hmm. This is what good is stuff. The- I, you know, Pete, I really appreciate all your transparency and sharing, you know, because a lot of times everybody wants to especially with like coaches in the industry, I see a lot of people coaching, mentoring, but they don't, you don't get to see how the sausage is made and you don't really hear the challenges they have, but they might be really charismatic. They might really be good at speaking, but there's, there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes. And, and then what a lot of coaches in the industry do is they try to get people to build the business the way they did, which may not even be working. And so, I think what's important, I think every business owner needs to build the business around themselves. It needs to be built to allow them the maximum level of fulfillment and freedom and contribution and support in their own business. And that fifth reason of safety and certainty. And that means every business is going to be unique because every business owner is unique. Like if you started a property management business right now, it would be run very differently than some others because you're very operationally minded. And you would build your team very differently than somebody that's very visionary sales oriented, right? And I think it's important to get the right team built around you. And a lot of times, I think the foundational challenge is a lot of business owners aren't clear on themselves. And then they start building a team and they're miserable. They have an entire team and they're still miserable. They've kind of built the wrong team. Well, I think uh, every new business owner does that, right? They they, uh, they don't feel like they deserve good people. So they, they self-sabotage sometimes, right? When I first started, they don't believe the good people are out there. A lot of times they just don't even believe there's good people. They're like, Oh, everybody's terrible. So guess what they attract. Right. And what's surprising, the, the truth is just like you had mentioned, when you find good people, they will exceed you doing that role. Especially if it's one of your minus signs, it's not one of the hats you enjoy wearing. They will be better at it than you if they enjoy doing it. 100%. 100%. And that's super humbling for these early stage entrepreneurs because they think they're the best at everything initially. There's two, there's two thoughts, right? So when you hire somebody, you know, there's the whole uh, abdication of it. And then there's the, um, there's the delegation and then there's the micromanagement. Mm. Right? And so uh, what I find is that when people hire uh, people in the United States, they abdicate a lot of times when they hire people that are remote, they want to micromanage for whatever reason, even though they've invested a lot more money in the, uh, in in the person in the United States. Right. And then there's people that just, they just abdicate regardless. Right. And what I mean by abdication is, um, you know, I'm a property manager. I'm doing a whole bunch of stuff myself. I hire an assistant and I just kind of throw up on them and say, here's all the things that I'm doing. Go ahead and do it. There's no direction. There's no accountability. There's no management. Right. And then they get excited. Like, Oh yeah, I'm a great delegator. No, you're an advocator. You're not a delegator because you're not giving them the, the tools and the guidance that's needed. And then what happens is the VA or the person leaves and like, well, I don't understand. I can't find any good people. So I'm just going to keep doing it myself. 
Yeah. Right? So the, the first thing is when you hire somebody, you have to understand you just can't just advocate. You you have to make time for them, especially in the first couple of months. Mm-hmm. Right? They have they're learning you and your culture. At the end of the day, if you are the sole operator and the business owner, each one of us have core values. Right? We have our personal core values. Most of those are going to be embedded into the company that we build. They should be anyway. You shouldn't change your core values for your company. Just, you know, like if I'm full of integrity, I'm not going to create a company that's, that's not, that doesn't have a lot of integrity. Right. right? Just, it's just going to be. So these people are going to learn by, by you training them or your team training them, right? The core values will, will get, gets, core values always get pushed down. If you have no, if you're listening to this and you do not have core values in your company, you have core values in your company. They're just not yours. The team created core values. They push them up. Yeah. And they may, may or may not be the ones that you want. Right. But when you hire somebody, it's important that you spend a lot of time with them to train them, to train them properly so that they understand what they're doing. And, and so me, what I have found is that most jobs can be trained within two to three weeks, right? Especially if you're wearing one hat, the more what I call decision points or if then else's. And the, the biggest one that I found is in maintenance. Maintenance coordination has a lot of decision points. Mm-hmm. What if it's over over the, the threshold? What if it's a home warranty? What if it's an emergency? What if it's cosmetic, right? You go on and on and on. That's why it took me 90 days because we had to go through every one of those scenarios and I had to train on it. Mm-hmm. And it's just a little bit more in depth. My least renewable person, I was able to train her in like two to three weeks. Mm-hmm. And she, and you're right. And so by the training and by creating the KPIs and then by having a weekly meeting with structure, right? So- I, nothing gets me more fired up than having a meeting just to have a meeting. And then mm-hmm. we sit there and we sit there yeah. for an hour and I literally just wasted mm-hmm. not just my time, but everybody else's time all because we don't have any structure. So mm-hmm. I'm a big fan of EOS. I'm sure that you have something that's very similar to a, a meeting structure. We but call it Torgro OS. Mm-hmm. Torgro OS. Mm-hmm. So the Torgro OS. So if, if you're, if you're not part of Torgro, join Torgro and get on the OS. Like that's like number one, right? Because it'll, if, if you just get your meetings in order, you yeah. will see an increase in productivity just like that. Mm-hmm. And one, yeah. one of the things that I make sure I do is when I, so by the way, the maintenance team that I built, they always reported to me, even, even when I sold the till day, I sold the company. I just had a soft spot for them. I like maintenance. I know I'm weird that way, but I really did. Mm -hmm. Um, And so they reported to me. My other team, I had other supervisors. I actually had supervisors in Mexico that were managing the other team, other team members in Mexico. And then that supervisor reported to somebody in the US or to report directly to me. But Mm -hmm. I still had my weekly meeting with my team every week. And we had our OS. And one of the questions I asked every week was two questions that were always. Number one was always, what can I do as the business owner to make your job easier? I think there's a, I think there's a, a sphere, a circle, right? My job is to take care of my team. My yeah. team's job is to take care of the client. The client's job is to take care of the business and the business job is to take care of me. That's the circle that, that I'm, right? So no, the, the, the client is not always right. And let's do what we have to do to make sure that if we did mess up, we want to make it right. And I get all that. But how can I make my team's job easier? And that could be, I need to go talk to Sandy in accounting because she's not doing something. Or it means, hey, I need to create, can you create this report for me? I need a, a, whatever it is. What can I do? The, the last question I asked on every meeting was, what is your stress level on a scale of one to 10? And this was really important because it does two things. Number one, if somebody is a 10 plus for three weeks in a row, they are ready to punch out. Yeah, no yeah. quit. Ready to leave. Mm-hmm. No one wants to work in a stressful environment for more than like, you know, like if we can see that, like, hey, it's summer, we're a little short staffed, you're going to be stressed for next, you know, six to eight weeks, but there's a, you know, but we're, but we're going to do X, Y, and Z to get you, get out of it. I get it. And people will, will handle stress for a short period of time. The mm-hmm. second thing is, believe it or not, sometimes people are stressed out and has nothing to do with, with you or your company. I know we all think it's about us yeah. and our company, but um, personal so- stuff personal stuff. So one time I actually, uh, and so if anybody's 10 plus, and I want to talk to them. I do it uh, off the meet. Like we have a one-on-one say, Hey, stay on everybody else. Get off the meeting, whatever. Yeah. And I had this one lady, uh, 10 plus. And I said, I said, Hey, you're, you know, you're usually a two what's going on. My brother got hit by a car. Right mm-hmm. now. What this does is everybody who's always asking me how, uh, how can I, you know, how can I bring my team, my remote team 
into our culture. This is a great way, right? Because at the end of the day, just like you, you want to give time to your owner clients and you want to build relationships, you want to build relationships with your, with your remote team. And so yeah. by, by taking an interest in them as human beings, right? It doesn't mean you have to give them, I'm not going to, I didn't fly down and give them a whole bunch of money. I just listened and I, and I cared that her brother was doing okay. And I would ask, and it was just, it was just an emotional human thing. My team, if your team and in, in, if your remote team know that you actually do care about them, yeah, cases, oh, they it. are, you're covering their nut. <clears throat> Meaning they're making a, a plenty of money. Could they you say that again? You broke up a little bit. So if your remote team knows that you care about them, yeah, if the remote team, if the remote team knows you care about them, they're not going to leave you for fifty cents more or a dollar more an hour. They're just yeah. not, um, because most of the time, if you're paying them a fair wage, they are they are making a, more than enough money to cover their what I call their nut, you know, to just to cover their living expenses. So they're not going to leave because the grass isn't always greener, and they are freaking happy. If you make your team happy by asking them how can I help, how can I make your job easier, and letting them know that you care about them as people. That's the, you know, that that's that's a, like a number three question I get, right? No, number number one is how do I train them? Number two is where do I find them? Number three is how do I make them part of the team? This is how you make them part of the team, right? By by advocating and just throwing a bunch of throwing a bunch of stuff on them and letting them go, that's not how you do it. And by micromanaging them, say I want to see all the screenshots. I want you to write down everything you did from this time to this time. And if you take a fifteen minute break, I need you to punch out and punch in. Like, like that's it's not doing it either. Right. You said it earlier. You, you manage by results. That's what I do. Do I care if you put 40 hours a week in? I really don't. I'll pay you for 40. But if you get if 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 um, if you're available and I need you. Right. So I, I manage on availability first. You have to be available. So we have policy. We use Slack. If I Slack you, you Slack me back within 30 minutes. If I email you, you email me back within four hours. If we have a meeting, you're on video and you're in your home office. None of this Starbucks crap. None of this on the beach crap. Like you're in your home office. You're working, right? Yeah. Um, so availability is number one. Then number two is KPIs. Are you are you meeting or exceeding your KPIs? Number three, and if I have the right KPIs, I could just look, and if it's green, I know that that position is doing well. And then number three is escalations. Am I getting calls from our clients or from internal members of the company? Saying that you're not that you can't that you're not doing your job or you're not getting back to him or whatever. Those are the three things I need to know. I don't need to know that you're moving your mouse every thirty seconds. Mm -hmm. I could care. I could care less on that. If I got those three things, I know you know. And again, I know I have the right people because I hired them based on my core values or the company's core values. Yeah, totally. We we do a lot of the similar things at DoorGrow. Like one of my mentors would say, cadence is culture, and I really believe that the cadence of your meetings creates the culture. It really does. And this is where you're able to set the culture with your team. And we ask questions like, where are you stuck? How can we support you? We do caught being awesome. Um, we, you know, and I think what team members really want more than money, a lot of entrepreneurs, we like money, right? We don't hate money. And so we assume mistakenly that that's the highest priority for all of our team members. Well, I'll just give them bonuses or I'll pay them more. The reality is most team members, with the exception of maybe entrepreneurs and salespeople, most everybody else on the planet would prefer, once their basic needs are met financially, would prefer to be recognized rather than get a bonus. And so creating the right cadence and creating a system like Dorgo OS allows the team to be seen and recognized for their accomplishments strategically and moving the business forward. And that prioritizes that. We find that if you can get those three systems in place, the planning system, that's like DoorGrow OS here at DoorGrow, the people system, we've got DoorGrow hiring, applicant tracking system, et cetera. And the process system, we've got DoorGrow flow and, and some other stuff. If you have these three systems in place, these are three of the biggest profit levers you can get in place. And a lot of times people try to skip those three and jump right into profitability and micromanage through just more severe actions, more severe KPIs, and trying to control more, thinking they can squeeze more blood from the stone. When yep. if they did these three profit levers, we've got clients that are hitting amazing profit margins. They don't even have KPIs because they don't even need them because they trust their team members so much and their team members are really great culture fits and really motivated. And so 
focus on those three profit levers first and you're going to make a lot more money. And really what happens is you get three times the output from good team members easily. And it, they can be anywhere. And what's what I love about being able to have a remote team, we've got team members all over the place. Some in the US, mm-hmm. Canada, Mexico, one's in London yes. now, yeah. Philippines. I'm able to hire the best. I'm able to hire the best no matter where they are. And I'm able to also, for certain roles, get make sure it's really affordable for the business. And and so we're not, I'm not too particular about where they're at or what they're doing. It just mm-hmm. needs to be a, a price point that we can afford. And I need a really good out, outcome. And if we can get that, then th- that's the ideal. And it's easier for me to run things remotely than if everybody were interrupting me coming into my office all day long. Yep. It's a lot quieter. And I feel like everybody's able to get more done, but we're able to create that connection in our daily huddles. We check in with everybody, ask where they're stuck. We do one-on-ones like you were talking about, all these things to figure out where everybody are at. The one thing that we do that I think is really impactful is we have our team members do time studies, not as a punitive measure, but you know, as a way to support them and figure out how to get them additional support and help. And this is where we figure out which are, what are their plus and minus signs. So Adam, who's been on my team for almost, I think almost a decade now. Yeah, like nine years. And um, you know, he started as a content writer and I've, he's done multiple time studies. And every time he gets really honest with me, he's like, these are the things I don't enjoy doing anymore. I'm not enjoying doing all this writing. What do you enjoy? I enjoy interacting with the clients. He now manages our entire department for fulfillment when it comes to websites, branding, all this. He's got a whole team under him. Yep. Whereas nobody initially would have thought, hey, Adam is a manager. But he, by default, naturally became one because we just got him the support he needed. And so he's been, he, and that's how we've been able to retain Adam. And the cool thing about retaining team members is they're like wine. They get better with time. Yes, they do. They get better and better. And so Adam knows lots of ins and outs in the business. He's super adaptable and versatile. And we're able to use them for billing related stuff and website stuff. And there's so many things over time that he's developed and absorbed and learned. He can run significant pieces of the business for me if necessary. Well, I'll give you a funny story because, you know, here I am teaching and telling you, oh, here's how you, you know, hire people, right? So when I first started VPM, um, Leon, who is our onboarding guy now, came over and he was with me at Mind and he was with me at Empire. So I've known Leon and I knew he had our core values, right? Hmm. And so we're like maybe like eight months in and I go to one of my business partners and I go, hey, man, I don't think Leon's working out, you know? And he's like, really? He goes, so he, he did the, I called the Mongolian reversal, right? Because he basically takes my words and he puts them right back at me. He goes, um, let me ask you, um, what's his job description? And yeah. it's crickets. I'm like, yeah, he don't really have a job description. You know, I'm like, I'm like, he's like, what's his KPIs? I'm like, yeah, we haven't really got to that. Yet. <laughs> you know, so he's like, and how much have you trained him? And I'm like, all right, enough. Like, basically, Leon was the right guy. I just didn't know what he's supposed to do. So how did he know he was supposed to do? So yeah. then I got, I got serious about the job description. Yeah. And then <laughs> what we realized is Leon was running about two hats, maybe three hats. Mm. And he was really, really like he, he was good at one of them. So yeah. we ended up hiring another guy, Angelino, and gave that hat away. And now Leon just runs and now he is thriving yeah. and he's exceeding all of the metrics that we put in, in his place. And he's the happiest he's ever been. Yeah. And so, you know, even though you know this stuff, sometimes you have to continuously, you know, make sure that you're doing it. (laughs) Oh, yeah. We had a conversation last night Mm -hmm. about a team member that we realized they weren't doing some things right. And Sarah put it back in my face. She's like, well, did you train them on this? And I was like, no, I didn't. (laughs) I I made a mistake in training. I thought they would understand it in my superficial explanation. And you yeah, can't and take so, shortcuts, right? Like, yeah. you know, those three things that you put out there, like the, the hiring and the, and the process, it sounds so easy, right? But we know it's tedious. Mm-hmm. And there's a, that's, a, that's the reason why most entrepreneurs who, who are most of them are visionaries, right? A, a lot of yeah. guys that start business visionaries, they're not in the details. They don't mm-hmm. like doing that. It's not natural. Right. They need an integrator. They need, a, <laughs> they need an integrator. Like, like, I'm guessing Sarah's the integrator. I'm the integrator. I'm guessing yeah. you're the visionary, right? Uh, so they need an integrator to to literally do that stuff. And 
you know, you, you get, like I said, you, 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 when you do it, you, you, you get it back in perpetuity. Like it just, once, yeah. the, once the system is complete, it's just tweaking. It's not rebuilding, mm -hmm. you know, uh, once you, you know, and, uh, and so, you know, but a lot of visionaries, they skip that part because they don't, they don't like that part. Yeah, you know, I agree. Hire a consultant or hire the, hire somebody that, that likes that stuff. Yeah. And I love that you just keep like, thank you for <laughs> continuously driving home the point. Like you have to train people. You have to. And a lot of times what we see is we see like, doesn't matter your location, doesn't matter your size, doesn't even matter what industry you're in. People hire out of pain, which makes sense, but mm. they're in so much pain that they're like, oh, they think as soon as they hire somebody, they're like, oh, like I'm it's solved. It's not solved yet because no. you haven't trained them. That's not the hard work. The it's about to start. Yeah. They're like, oh, I have the person. And now like, this isn't my problem anymore. It's still your problem until yeah. they are properly trained. And it does take time. So for a period of time, when you hire somebody, your life is going to get worse. You're going <laughs> to be taking on more. Yeah. If you want them to do a good job, that is what has to happen because if you hire somebody yeah. and you're like, here, just have it like baptism by fire, figure it out. Like That's go ahead and do it. It's not going to work yeah. out. You're going to be frustrated. They're going to be frustrated and it looks bad for both people. And then you guys are both frustrated at each other and you're like, why are they not working out? And this person is like, I didn't even get training. Like, I don't like, you're mad at me all the time. And I just like, I don't even know what to do, but like, you didn't tell me what to do. Like, help me. And then, help and then me. it's like, I'm not going to hire V I'm not going to hire people because I just, there's no good people out there. Right. It's just, yeah. yeah. When, I, when I was telling you that, that story about training the maintenance team, I was trained about two hours a day on the maintenance, which is a little too much. Probably an hour and a half is probably the, the max somebody could take, but I was doing two hours. That didn't mean that my 10 hour day was still a 10 hour day. It became a 12 hour day. Cause I still had yeah. 10 hours yeah. of work I had to do. I just, I just took on more two hours of training. And a lot of times they ask more, I, a lot of times it's even more than that. Cause as you're training, what I have found, and maybe you guys see the same thing is as I'm training, I actually learn a lot more about my processes and about my company. And then I realize, Oh, there's no policy here. Oh, there's no field for that. Oh, that's just yeah. in my head. However I feel that day, I'm going to, I'm going to judge on that. Like, yeah. and so I, there was a lot of work that I ended up having to do as I'm creating the, the you know to training you know like oh man this process is not exactly at all what i thought yeah yeah cool well p it's so this has been an awesome conversation we appreciate you coming on the show um why don't you tell everybody just a little bit about vpm solutions do a quick plug and how they can reach out and connect with you yeah so uh thanks for that so vpm solutions <laughs> is an online platform that connects property management companies with remote team members uh, it's a direct hire, so they don't work for VPM. They work directly for you. You negotiate the hourly rate. There is no upfront cost, and there is no fee to use the site. So it's all free for the company managers. The way VPM makes money is the virtual assistant pays 10%. So when they apply to a job, they have a breakdown of this is how much hourly rate that I'm applying for, this is how much that VPM charges a platform fee, and this is how much that I'll get. We also have about 20, I think 23 free training. So um, there, there's training on the site from fair housing to marketing, social media, to pro we have a, a flagship property management 101 courses. It's about, it's about nine, uh, 12, 12 courses, nine hours of content. Wow. And it's there just to teach folks the basics of property management. No, you're not going to hire them and they're going to be able to run and be a property manager for you, but they're going to know the ins and outs of the verbiage of, of just the life cycle, like high level stuff. But our, it's our attempt to get people trained up so that when you, so that when you get them, they're not, they're not like that, at least they're crawling, right? They, they, yeah. Like they're, they're getting, you know, they have a little bit of deal, a little bit of, of information. And then we also have, um, we also have some free resources that, that are on the site as well. Like we have, uh, I think we have 50 job descriptions with disk profiles uh, that we, you know, assume assumpted disk profiles. Mm -hmm. We also have like org charts, like what you should org chart should be as you grow your business. And then we also have uh, just a list of all the, all the vendors and resources and all the different um, Facebook groups and, and um, uh, all of the conferences that are out there for, for property management. Matter of fact, you're actually on that site, by the way, as a vendor. Cool. Uh, 
<laughs> so uh, yeah, so that's that's what we do. Um, and then we also offer what we call the white glove service. It's a free service that helps you go through the hiring process. Because we what we realized early on, it's a do-it-yourself platform. But what we realized is most people don't have a hiring process. They have no idea what to do. So we kind of guide them. Now your team, your your clients probably have a good hiring process, but we'll offer like we'll offer that free white glove service to them as well if they want to come in and just need a little bit of help. Um, like what should they ask before they interview? Like, you know, there's some red tape, like we say, you get a disc profile, have, you know, and then um, the, we have these courses that they take, they get certifications. You can search based on those certifications. Hmm. So it's, it's really the only platform literally built for property management. Love it. Awesome. Yeah. Very cool. We'll check it out. So, so everybody make sure you check out Pete Newbig's uh, VPM solutions. Take a look at that. And uh, Pete, thanks for being on the show today. It was a good conversation. Yeah. Thanks guys. Thanks Jason. Thanks Sarah. Appreciate you. All right. So if you are a property management entrepreneur, you're wanting to grow or add more doors, or you're struggling with dealing with your team, reach out to us at DoorGo. We can help you with this. We do this all the time. We would love to support you. We have clients that are easily going from, we can help you scale anywhere from zero to a thousand plus. And anybody can do this in the next three to five years. We would love to support you, help you scale your business and help you save collapse a lot of time and not have to go through and make so many mistakes in your business. And so until next time to our mutual growth, bye everyone.